Martin, who are the key influencers in the general nutrition market? What we've seen has been a process of mergers and acquisitions over several decades. And so an increasing concentration with brand names that we are familiar with in our houses, which are all being brought together into a small number of corporations, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Kraft, and others. And these corporations have now have incredible power, power over the suppliers, but also power over the products that get into the supermarkets uh, and therefore into our kitchens. So what are the concrete results, examples of this power game? What we've seen is the way in which these corporations have been able to change the, the narrative to focus on uh, the issues that benefit them. Uh, so we've seen particularly with obesity, clearly an issue in nutrition, where the Coca-Cola Corporation has been funding a network, the Global Energy Balance Network, that has been trying to put all the attention on lack of exercise and away from calorie intake. Uh, funding researchers uh, to put forward the case that suits the corporation itself. So they've been trying to change the way we think about things, controlling the research, um, undermining research that disagrees with them. But we've also seen the way in which corporations have played a role with the providers of uh, food. Many of the foods come from low-income countries, of course, and uh, by, uh, getting, by reducing the working conditions of the farmers, uh, by essentially putting them into debt, creating a new form almost of slavery. Um, we've seen a real problem with the ability uh, the, of people in some of the lower the poorest countries in the world to ever get out of this debt trap that they're in because the large corporations just have so much power over what is bought and sold. So how good have epidemiologists been at analyzing these mechanisms and integrating that into their work? Well, originally epidemiologists looked at the immediate risk factors for disease. They looked at infections for example. Then they looked at the factors that led to non-communicable diseases tobacco, cholesterol, and so on. Over time, they've moved upstream. They've looked at the social determinants like poverty and inequality, but now they're moving even further upstream to look at what we call the corporate determinants, to look at the organizations that drive these epidemics. One of the interesting analogies by people working in the tobacco field has been to say that in a way, what we see with tobacco-related disease is no different from that with malaria. It's just that in malaria, the vectors are the mosquitoes, whereas in tobacco-related disease, the vectors are the tobacco companies. And it's in the same way that we, if we want to tackle malaria, we need to do something about mosquito control. If we want to tackle the tobacco epidemic, we need to do something about the tobacco industry. So what would be a good approach to educate epidemiologists? I think we're already seeing that. We're seeing epidemiologists getting out of their disciplinary silos and using innovative methods to understand how these influences are being brought to bear, using methods like textual analysis to look at legislation to see if the legislation is more supportive of the public health approach or the industry approach. Um, using internal industry documents pioneered with the tobacco industry but now being used with the food and alcohol industry as well to then look at some of the more subtle influences in the same way that economists have been doing for a long time trying to look at revealed preferences the way people make decisions drawing all of these methods from political science from law legal analyses and so on and bringing them to bear with what we might traditionally think of as epidemiological problems so how is TTIP going to influence all this, Martin? Speaking today, I think it's now very unlikely that TTIP will actually be signed. I think what we've seen with the uh, trans Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership has really been a success for public health in Europe because we were very concerned particularly about the very secretive investor state dispute settlement process. We campaigned very hard for a more transparent mechanism based with judges, public documentation, in exactly the same way that a trade dispute within Europe would be settled by the European Court of Justice and not in some secretive way. The EU TTIP team bought into this. That was the point, the perspective they were putting forward. But of course, we always knew that it would be very difficult to get that past the Americans. And I think that's what we're now seeing. But they can't roll back because the European Parliament has been very clear. There are now lines in the sand. The French government, uh, Francois Hollande, has said exactly the same. So I'm not sure that we'll actually move forward because the Americans will not concede to the European demands. So in addition to that, would 
you have a view on the UK and TTIP after Brexit? Who knows? I'm one of these people who is not convinced that the UK will actually leave the European Union. Quite frankly, because I'm not sure that we have the ability to do so. I think the uh, politicians are only beginning to realise the sheer complexity of doing this. The former head of the civil service in an interview this week said that it could be uh, into the 2030s before we disentangle ourselves, such is the complexity. I think it will probably take several years even to get agreement within the ruling Conservative Party because, of course, they have a diversity of views. Add into that getting parliamentary agreement for whatever moves forward. Maybe not parliamentary approvement, approval to trigger our trigger Article 50, but for everything that comes after that, add in Scotland, Northern Ireland, which is really an insoluble problem, Gibraltar, the Crown Dependencies, it'll be decades, and we have no civil servants who can do it anyway.